going to do is, well, I, I, let me just in, let me just introduce uh, Dr. Godwin. Thank you again for joining us for our monthly lunchtime webinar. Uh, we are very fortunate today to hear from Dr. Hillary Godwin, who is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, as well as our Associate Dean for Academic Programs. She will be discussing the health impacts of climate change on vulnerable communities, as well as the importance of regional partnerships in developing sustainable climate action plans that focus on helping these communities build resilience towards climate change. Dr. Godwin, I'm going to hand it off to you and take it away. Great. Thanks, Ellen, and uh, thank you, uh, those of you who are joining us today in person. Um, so. Picking out the system here. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to start by talking about just a general overview of why it's so important for public health professionals to get engaged in climate change um, action planning and response, and then go through 10 critical things that every public health professional should know about climate change before I get into some details about what's projected for Los Angeles in terms of climate change and both what we're doing here and uh, what you can do um, in your own jurisdiction as well or through your own organization. So starting with <clears throat> why it's important for public health professionals to know about climate change, uh, we've heard a lot uh, from the climate scientists about their concerns that uh, the average American doesn't feel that they have a personal connection to climate change. So although we've seen substantial increases in the number of people who um, believe that climate change is real, we're still below the 50% mark in terms of the number of people who feel like it's going to affect them or that it's a top priority in terms of policy um, in the United States. And that's a problem because, as we all know, public concern is a major driver for um, politicians when they decide whether or not to act. And also, it's a critical driver for individuals' decisions about whether or not to change their behavior. So um, public health professionals um, have long been considered to be sort of the linchpin by the climate community in terms of being able to communicate with both the general public and also to policymakers about what the impacts of climate change will be for the communities that they're in, the communities that they serve, and um, motivating them to make positive changes either at a policy level or at an individual level. And the reason for that is that there have been a number of studies that show, um, as we know, that that individuals are highly motivated um, when they feel that their own health is at stake or when their children's health is at stake. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as well, um, because we, we as public health professionals have substantial experience working with um, many different communities and communicating with those communities um, and particularly working with uh, many of the vulnerable populations that are going to be disproportionately impacted by climate change. So those are all reasons why it's really essential that public health professionals um, get engaged in both global level um, conversations about the impacts of climate change and also um, discussions at the local level that are critical to us moving forward in terms of addressing um, both behaviors that could decrease the amount of climate change that we see overall and help us to prepare for the climate change that we expect to see. So next I want to talk about 10 things that every public health professional should know about climate change just so that we're all on the same page as we start to talk about this. So the first of those is that our climate has dramatically changed in the last 50 to 100 years. So this is a picture of, uh, from Alaska, from one of the major glaciers, and you can see the enormous difference um, in just a 55-year period, uh, or 65-year period, rather, um, in the size of that glacier. And this is not atypical of our polar regions, which have been dramatically impacted. Um, as well, we've seen dramatic changes in uh, tropical regions. So both Africa and, um, and Southeast Asia have been dramatically impacted already by climate change. We see huge impacts on not just temperatures, but also extreme weather events. And, 
and those are impacting people's daily lives. So this is not something hypothetical or theoretical, it's something that's already happening. Second, uh, there's strong evidence that climate change has already had significant impacts on health. The WHO has uh, sought to quantify that and has come up with an estimated um, ac number of deaths due to climate change that occur already each year as being greater than 150,000 worldwide. And in this map, which shows uh, in darker colors where the higher number of um, deaths um, per a unit of population occur, you can see that uh, the southern latitudes are, are much more highly impacted and that's both because we're seeing more extreme weather events happening in those regions and also because um, Afri Africa and Asia are also home to some of our most vulnerable populations worldwide. So um, they're experiencing dramatic impacts and also have um, some of the least ability to withstand the additional impacts. Um, many of the deaths that you see uh, estimated here by the WHO are due to um, increased levels of um, either uh, vector-borne diseases or diarrheal diseases, um, but they also are as a result of, for instance, extreme weather events, and including extreme heat events, but not limited to them um, in all of these different regions. The third fact that everyone needs to know is that the increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since 1750 have been the primary driver for recent climate change. So this is from uh, the most recent uh, report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from their fifth assessment report that just came out this past year. Um, and uh, shows on the top graph um, increasing carbon dioxide levels over the period from 1960 to 2010. Um, and you can see, although there's, um, within each year, there are oscillations in carbon dioxide levels, but the increasing levels um, of carbon dioxide are indeed um, um, a steady increase over that time period. And we know at this point that that increase is a result of anthropogenic activity. Um, and also that it is uh, much greater than what we would expect from um, natural sources. So again, another figure from the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report, if we look at uh, the magnitude of the change that we've seen in carbon dioxide levels in recent years, it greatly exceeds what we've seen over um, the last almost uh, a million years. And um, those fluctuations, the fluctuations, um, it differs in two major ways. So the first is that the increase has happened much more rapidly than prior changes in carbon dioxide levels that were a result of natural sources. And the other is that the carbon dioxide level that we have currently is much greater than the uh, more extreme fluctuations that we've seen in the past due to natural sources. The fifth thing that, that it's important for all public health professionals to know is that there's broad consensus about this uh, within the climate community. So although we often see reports in the media about uh, individuals who don't agree that humans are causing climate change, within uh, the field of climate experts, there's 97% agreement. And uh, for all of us who work in academia, we know that it's, it's hard to get 97% of academics to agree on, on anything. So um, we would consider this to be an extremely high level of consensus. Um, frequently people ask me why are we calling it climate change now instead of global warming and the reason is that because climate, the term climate change is a more accurate description of the effects that we anticipate. So uh, it's not just that we expect to see an overall warming in the average global temperature, uh, but also that we expect to see the entire curve describing um, both temperatures and other uh, weather events to shift towards um, the extremes. So we expect more hot weather um, and more record hot weather. 
and actually in the, this is from the last um, assessment report. In the fifth assessment report, they actually show a, a flattened curve for a new climate, which um, indicates that both tails are um, getting more extreme. So events like the extremely cold winter that we've been seeing in the Northeast this year um, also reflect um, that increase towards extreme events. Um, the result of this is that <clears throat> we not only expect to see more hot days or, and more cold days, um, but also that we expect to see more extreme weather events like hurricanes, extreme droughts, and, um, and uh, ex extreme flooding events, all of which have dramatic impacts both on our ability to um, produce food uh, reliably as well as quality of water and also um, are just a threat in general to um, individuals who um, are living in the areas that are affected by them. So for instance, although we can't say that any one specific event, one particular hurricane um, might be caused by climate change, we can certainly say that the increased frequency of more high impact hurricanes that we've seen over the last uh, 30 years, that trend is a result of climate change. And furthermore, the more damage that we, the significant damage that we saw, for instance, with Superstorm Sandy in the New York area, um, even if you weren't comfortable saying that Superstorm Sandy itself was the result of climate change, uh, the reality that the sea level had risen um, in recent decades means that when we did have that hur hurricane, that low-lying areas were much more vulnerable to the impact of the hurricane. So in that way, even though we don't talk about one specific event being related to climate change, certainly the increased frequency of these much more extreme and much more deadly events um, is related to climate change. Um, the seventh concept that's really critical is that climate change affects human health through multiple pathways. So in describing this process, um, we typically look at climate impacts on regional weather changes, um, which includes not only heat waves, but also, as I said, extreme weather, changes in temperature, and also precipitation patterns. And those then impact modulating influences that could range from, um, for instance, our agricultural system to microbial contamination pathways and also sociodemographic factors and then result in a series of different health effects. And those health effects aren't limited to the more obvious ones, such as temperature-related illness and death, or even um, the ones that we just discussed, extreme weather-related health effects, but also secondary impacts, such as air pollution related to health effects, um, and also uh, impacts on water and foodborne diseases. The most obvious one of these is that if we have increased flooding, um, we recognize that flooding events are often associated with outbreaks of waterborne infectious diseases. Um, the very um, unpredictable weather patterns are already um, causing food and water shortages in some regions of the world and, uh, of course, have impacts on mental health and well-being of populations. Um, we've already seen significant impacts in some regions on the range of different infectious diseases. Um, and also uh, correlated with impacts on food and water, start to see um, nutritional deficiencies and diseases. For us in California and in the American Southwest in general, water scarcity will probably be one of our biggest impacts of climate change. So this is something that, that climate scientists are working hard to um, make sure that we have really robust predictions for. Um, for us, a big issue is that the predictions for the American Southwest is not so much that we're going to see less precipitation, but that more of that precipitation will fall as rain as opposed to snow. And this is important for us because our water capture system is highly dependent upon snow melt. So um, our, our system of reservoirs um, assumes that snow will be melting slowly over the period um, of the spring and the summer and allow water to be delivered to particularly, in our case, Southern California, um, much later after um, it's fallen. 
when that precipitation run falls as rain instead of snow, um, we then need to have systems that can capture stormwater, which are not the type of systems that, that we've necessarily invested in. Um, so as a result, um, sort of our design for how to collect and transport water um, is based upon a different model from what we expect to see going forward. Um, then on top of that, um, we also have the compounding problem of the expectation that there will be more frequent and more extreme droughts. So again, although we can't say definitively that the current drought that we're experiencing in California is a result of climate change, um, we certainly can say that our expectation is that as a result of climate change that we would expect to see um, both more extreme droughts and more extreme flooding uh, going forward. Um, the other thing that is really important for us as public health professionals to recognize is that climate change will affect other regions even more severely than they are predicted to affect us, but those resulting problems from those impacts will be global. So here in Los Angeles, we're a, a very diverse and multicultural city. Uh, we have people from all over the world who have uh, immigrated here to Los Angeles and call it home, and we expect that as climate change worsens in many of the poorest areas of the world, and we uh, have refugee crises that result from those, that climate change, whether it's extreme flooding in Bangladesh or food and water scarcity in um, sub-Saharan Africa, we expect that the number of refugees will increase globally and that uh, Los Angeles and other parts of California will naturally be a place that uh, those refugees will some subset of those refugees will want to relocate to. Um, and as a result, we will need to deal with the implications of both rising population and also um, spread of infectious diseases that accompany um, mass migrations. In addition, we've already seen effects of food shortages causing civil unrest in many parts of the world, um, and it's anticipated that food shortages and water shortages arising from climate change um, will result in um, civil unrest in many parts of the world more frequently going forward, um, and that this is a, a really significant priority um, for us, not just as global citizens, but also um, that we would expect to see direct repercussions um, at home from that as well. And finally, the, the last thing that I wanted to emphasize is that um, it's important not to, to look at all of this in despair and think, um, well, I can't do anything about it, so I should just um, hang up my hat and go home or ignore it. Um, we really can make a difference by acting now. So it's important, again, that public health professionals um, take a lead in communicating both the urgency of taking action and also the positive steps that people can take to make a difference. Um, we've seen in other um, areas of the world that people um, acting locally has had a dramatic impact in building resiliency and also um, decreasing the number of resources that people use. So a classic example of this is in Sydney, Australia. So in Australia, um, as a result of climate change, they've seen um, really extreme droughts and as a result of that, very extreme wildfires. Um, They've had a massive campaign to get the public on board, which has resulted in uh, nearly 97% of their population being supportive of sustainability initiatives in that, in that region. And uh, as a result, they've been able to build the political power to be able to implement very significant policies and programs that help to conserve resources and also build more resilient communities. So uh, this is what we need to be doing here in Los Angeles right now, and uh, we need to be working together to make that happen. So next I wanted to talk about uh, what is currently projected for Los Angeles in terms of climate change. So here I'm uh, referring to data that was um, resulted from a project conducted by Professor Alex Hall, who's at UCLA in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and is uh, really a world-recognized leader in climate modeling, and specifically in doing what's referred to as downscale modeling or high-resolution modeling. Um, so in this case, uh, Alec and his 
Alex and his research group have taken um, 30 different global climate models and used um, their, this downscaling technique to develop for the Los Angeles region projections that are at a two kilometer resolution. So this is about two orders of magnitude finer resolution that, than what we have globally. Um, and they've looked at two different greenhouse gas emission scenarios. One in which we just continue along the path that we're currently on, which is called business as usual. And one in um, which we significantly mitigate um, the amount of greenhouse gases that we emit uh, and basically stop emitting uh, new greenhouse gases um, fairly soon um, in this century to cause them to the greenhouse gas levels to, um, to stabilize. And they then looked at three different time periods. They looked at 1981 to 2000 as their baseline and then also looked at mid-century, 2040 to 2060, the predictions for mid-century, and the predictions for the end of the century, which would be 2081 to 2100. So uh, again, we're, we're really fortunate in Los Angeles to have these outstanding climate uh, modeling teams um, doing this very regionalized approach. Um, I'm mainly going to tell you about their um, temperature data, but they're doing similar work now um, looking at um, precipitation projections as well and how that's going to impact our water supply. Okay, so based upon um, the, this downscale modeling, uh, what they have found is that um, by mid-century, under the business as usual uh, model, that we predict that the average August temperature across the LA Basin will rise but that it will be much warmer in some regions and only slightly warmer in others. So not surprising to anyone who lives in the area, um, the expectation is that the coastal regions um, will not warm very much at all, um, but our inland areas will warm significantly. Um, and a critical insight that they got from that was that um, by mid-century, century, um, regardless of whether we significant, like basically curtail our emissions um, or keep them constant, um, so we have significant mitigation, or whether we continue on the same path that we're currently on, which is business as usual, that we expect a significant increase in the average August temperature for both of those scenarios. So um, you can see um, for each of those two scenarios compared to the baseline, which is in black on the left, um, that the average temperature under each of those scenarios at mid-century means that the average August temperature will be higher than the most hot August temperature than we had during the period of 1981 to 2000. So significantly hotter. Um, and, that, and looking at these projections and seeing very little difference between um, the mitigation scenario at mid-century and the business as usual um, scenario at mid-century can be somewhat disheartening because it can cause people to say, well, you know, why should I change my behavior because uh, it's, you know, I'm going to have these horrible impacts by mid-century um, either way. And we have two responses to that. The first response is, the important things that you can do to change your behavior um, to deal with what we expect for mid-century will have to include actions that will build resiliency of the local populations to these temperature changes that are already what we call baked in, that we know are going to happen. And this is, again, where public health professionals can play a key role in helping communities understand what their vulnerabilities are and helping them to build resiliency to those impacts. The other uh, response Oops, let me skip ahead. Oops, I guess I took it out. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so we'll come back to this, this later, but the other really important thing is that uh, when we look farther out at the end of the century, that um, there is actually a significant difference between um, the impacts that we expect for business as usual versus mitigation. So in the long run, it really does help us to make some changes in terms of our behaviors right now. 
Okay, so um, again, looking at the high resolution data that Alex and his team have um, put out, they've identified um, what the projected number of very hot days, so these are days over 99 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, um, that we currently see in black or in our baseline period, 1981 to 2000. And then the additional number of hot days that we expect in each of these different regions across the LA Basin um, by mid-century if we continue with business as usual. And again, remembering that the, the numbers aren't too different for the mitigation at mid-century. Um, so what's really stand out here is that some of our inland areas, including the San Fernando Valley, Porter Ranch, Woodland Hills, Santa Clarita, we're getting up close to 100 days over 99 degrees Fahrenheit um, by mid-century each year. So um, the way I think of that is, you know, it's like 25% of our days, basically, one in four days throughout the year, um, we can expect to be very hot in those inland areas. So clearly those are high priority areas where we need to look at uh, vulnerable populations, whether they're isolated elderly, people working in out in the outdoors and construction fields, um, people living below the poverty level who happen to be, uh, have small children who are again very vulnerable to extreme heat events. These are all groups that we need to identify within those regions and help build capacity at the community level to make sure that they know um, how to uh, uh, protect their health when we do have those very hot days. It's also particularly concerning about having so many of the hot days because what we've seen statistically um, is that it's not just um, having one hot day that's a problem. It's also having multiple hot days in a row um, that leads to increased morbidity and mortality. And that's particularly true for us here in Southern California where one of the mediating factors for extreme heat events is that we have these lovely cool evenings often even in the summer. And the cool nights really are important for um, mitigating those, those human health impacts. Unfortunately, when we have several hot days in a row, as we all know from experience, um, then we tend to have hotter nights. Um, and that's when we did tend to see these more um, profound impacts on human health. Um, again, though, really important to notice that there are some communities within uh, the LA Basin that we don't expect to be really affected by these extreme heat events at all. Um, so our coastal communities are great examples of that. Again, they have this wonderful um, moderating influence of having the ocean nearby. So Alex and his team have also worked with researchers at UC Irvine um, to look at what the projections are in terms of summer wildfires. So uh, this, these are difficult um, projections to make because the acres burned by wildfires was dependent not only upon um, hot summer temperatures, but also in our region dependent upon um, the wind patterns that we have. So as we all know, uh, for those of us living in Southern California, when we have Santa Ana winds, we're particularly vulnerable to uh, wildfires. And those Santa Ana winds arise as a result of differential um, temperature between the inland desert regions versus uh, the cooler um, coastal regions. And unfortunately, what we expect to see uh, with climate change in our region is not only more hot summer temperatures, but also an increase in that differential uh, between the two regions, which will exacerbate um, the Santa Ana winds. So the result of that, if we look at the projections for the number of acres burned by wildfires currently, um, our baseline is shown in gray, and then um, projections for mid-century business as usual is shown in red. Um, you can see that we expect overall a significant increase in the number of acres burned, but also a shift in when our primary wildfire season will occur. So currently, October is our highest um, risk month for wildfires in the Southern California area. Um, and again, that's highly correlated with um, the Santa Ana winds. As a result of the expected uh, changes in um, temperatures in Southern California, we expect um, that by mid-century that July and August will be our two uh, riskiest months for wildfires. And that's unfortunate uh, 
sort of compounded um, compounds a problem of that we expect that higher temperatures will also exacerbate um, problems with air quality within the region. So for instance, ground level ozone production is increased at higher temperatures. Um, so we expect to see that already happening in our summer months with increasing temperatures. Wildfires are also a, a huge contributor to poor air quality, not just locally in the areas affected, but also downwind, which can also be unpredictable. Um, so we expect that July and August are really going to be, um, the air quality is across the basin is going to be significantly impacted as a result of these trends. And then finally, here's the, the, the slide that I thought was going to come a few slides back, which is showing that um, it's not just about making sure that we're resilient, but also um, encouraging people to change their behavior so that um, we emit fewer greenhouse gases. And the, the compelling evidence for that comes when you look at the difference between the projections for the mitigation scenario versus the business as usual scenario at the end of the century. So if we go into this very extreme mitigation approach, you can see that end of century for the Southern California region, the Los Angeles region, actually doesn't look too much worse, if anything, maybe a little bit better than the projections for mid-century. However, if we continue emitting on the pathway that we're currently on, the business as usual scenario, things are going to be even worse by the end of the century. So again, you see that if on the business as usual projection that once again, um, that the average August temperature, which is the dot in the middle of those bars, um, would be higher than the hottest temperature at mid-century under the business as usual scenario. So we really need to get people back onto a, a, a curve um, where we are leading to a future at the end of the century that's more sustainable for our children. So um, I just wanted to summarize that um, it's really important to realize that climate change impacts for Los Angeles are not limited to just extreme heat events, but also to a wide range of impacts that are going to affect a lot of people. So often we see people focusing on quantifying the impacts of extreme heat events, partially because they're easier to quantify. However, for Southern California, as I explained, um, the impacts on our water system, impacts on air quality, impacts on wildfires are going to be really significant. In addition, um, coastal sea level rise is of great concern, particularly for some of our more vulnerable populations that are living near the port of LA. Um, and also, we have some really critical infrastructure, um, including um, sanitation systems that are located right at sea level that will be very vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, in addition, uh, we've been partnering with the LA County Department of Public Health to try and get some more detailed information about projections and also um, infectious disease ecologists to get some more detailed projections about what we might expect in terms of vector-borne disease spread for the area. Um, we know, you've seen it in the media recently, that everyone's concerned about impacts on the food systems, um, particularly through impacts on water, but also um, cro agricultural crops also are um, optimized for specific temperature growth as well. Um, and then also something that, that we feel needs to be looked at more extensively is impacts on the health systems. So within Los Angeles, we have a, a large number of hospitals. Um, and some of those are already, um, many of those are already uh, operating at near capacity. And so as we anticipate, for instance, um, effects on um, the population due to extreme heat events, increased um, allergies and asthma due to air quality, um, outbreaks of vector-borne diseases, wildfires and people um, having, again, air quality impacts or, or emergency events related to those. Um, all of those are going to impact our health systems in ways that we don't fully understand and need to be quantified. So one of the key questions that's sort of arisen from all of this, that's, and it's not unique to Los Angeles, um, it's true for all areas, is that we need to have a better understanding of the relative risks of different impacts for different communities. So um, we think of this as 
of needing to do this in two different ways. So the first is, uh, shown on the left, is that if I'm someone who's a public health professional who specifically is focusing on air quality, um, and I'm responsible for all of LA County, I need to know across the different neighborhoods in, in Los Angeles, which ones are going to be really severely impacted additionally by climate change impacts on air quality and which are moderately impacted and which are less impacted. And those um, impacts are going to be different from, for instance, the impacts which communities are impacted by wildfires or extreme heat events or vector-borne disease or sea level rise. So we need to know for each one of these different areas which regions within the county um, are our highest priority. The second effect, uh, second type of risk assessment that we need to have is shown on the right, which is that for a specific community, uh, for people working in that community, for instance, in community-based organizations or environmental justice groups, that community needs to know that out of all the different potential impacts of climate change, which ones are going to have the greatest impact on their community so that they can work and put their efforts on um, building resiliency to the areas where they can make the biggest difference. Um, and really a challenge here that's faced by local health departments, um, not just in California, but this particular study happened to be for California, is that many staff in local health departments feel that they don't have the knowledge, tools, financial resources, or in-house staffing um, to really um, engage in climate action planning and, um, and prepare for these impacts and help the populations that they serve prepare for these impacts. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the partnership that we have here at UCLA Fielding School Public Health with the um, LA County Department of Public Health and about what we're doing about both of those two different challenges and um, also give you some ideas about um, what you can be doing in your own region or organization as well. So um, the first is um, coming up with a way to address this need to be able to identify, uh, prioritize risks um, from different impact areas to a specific community and also within a particular impact area to identify which communities are most vulnerable. And here what we've done is to adopt a, a methodology that was developed by Kaiser Permanente uh, for the disaster management community and has been used extensively by disaster um, management specialists, which is called um, hazard vulnerability analysis or HVA. So the HVA approach in general um, allows you to combine qualitative and quantitative information um, in a systematic way to assess risks of potential events and help um, prioritize planning. And uh, what feeds into the calculation of the risk are measures of both the probability of a specific impact as well as um, trying to quantify both the human health impacts so that on individuals as well as community impacts. So for instance, with sea level rise, um, we're really concerned about community impacts in terms of community infrastructure, whereas extreme heat events, we're much more concerned about human health impacts. And then also to uh, rate the preparedness um, for each of these different events. So uh, we can say, you know, there might be things where uh, there is a big probability in the impacts are suspected to be large, but we've really prepared well. Um, conversely, there might be something where the impacts are projected to be slightly less, but we have zero preparedness. You might prioritize um, increasing preparedness for the latter. Um, and so what we've done is to adapt this methodology um, to use it for um, assessing the risks of different climate impacts, and we've used it specifically um, in Los Angeles um, County to assess the vulnerability of different neighborhoods. So uh, the case study that we've developed is using four different neighborhoods, um, and we specifically chose those neighborhoods um, in Los Angeles County to demonstrate um, high climate variability and, and variability in projected impacts. Um, the communities that we chose are Silmar, which is um, an inland um, area right up against the um, Angeles National Forest, um, which also happens to be the location of one of our um, major um, uh, community hospitals. 
um, and also where we project there's going to be really elevated temperatures in addition to wildfire issues. Santa Monica, where elevated temperatures and wildfires are not projected to be very big, um, but sea level rise is obviously a concern. Wilmington Harbor City, where we have very vulnerable populations, so you can see from the table on the right, um, very low per capita income, um, particularly compared to Santa Monica, the other coastal region. In addition, very high percentage of um, population in Wilmington Harbor City uh, living below the poverty level and um, critically um, renting their homes, which makes them much more vulnerable to um, flooding due to sea level rise. And then the fourth community that we chose um, was Southeast Los Angeles. Again, for us, a very vulnerable community um, and sort of moderate in terms of um, what we expect in terms of um, increased temperatures, for instance. Um, both the Southeast LA and Wilmington Harbor also have significant air quality issues that they're already dealing with. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details of how we did this, although I'm happy to talk with people about it individually. Um, but we used the HVA analysis to score each of the different impact areas for each of these four different communities. And here I'm just showing you the top three climate impact areas for each of the four communities. And they're shaded according to um, the magnitude of the risk. And one of the interesting things that we saw from this is that uh, the greatest risk that we saw um, from this initial analysis is for um, two of our communities, Silmar and Southeast Los Angeles, both of which have highly vulnerable populations, um, and health systems that are already significantly taxed. Um, we, our estimate is that uh, the greatest risk for those communities and is to the health system. Um, and then for Silmar, wildfires and extreme heat events are next. Um, and by contrast, uh, Santa Monica, um, we're actually projecting that water impacts, which again we mentioned would be um, substantial across the entire ba basin, probably are going to be the most significant impact for that particular area. Um, and that's as a result of the way that um, their dependence on uh, local groundwater and its vulnerability to um, impacts um, from sea level rise. Um, and then of course coastal sea level rise is important. Uh, Wilmington Harbor City, the greatest impacts on, again, from coastal sea level rise. So it really helps to illustrate that depending upon um, which area um, you're located in, the way that you would work with local community groups to build resiliency is very different. Okay, um, the second thing that we've worked on is to develop um, what we call the Climate and Health Workshop Series, which is a partnership with LA County Department of Public Health. Here we have a total of 16 workshops that were developed. Um, each one is between an hour and a half and two hours. Um, and uh, these were implemented over the course of a year. They focus on core topics related to climate and health, specific impacts to the Los Angeles area, and then uh, regulatory and policy issues. And each of the workshops included a brief seminar, which um, we've handed over the PowerPoints and made uh, recordings of some of them, um, made those available to LA County to continue using, plus detailed instructions for a brainstorming activity, um, uh, which we've also made available to the county. Um, and these are really in alignment with LA County's um, Department of Public Health action plan to reduce the health impacts of climate change, um, specifically um, their, their objectives to um, educate their staff about the um, impacts of uh, climate change and improve their ability to work with other organizations. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of the details about the topics that were covered. Um, the main thing that I wanted to emphasize is that um, in these workshops, I think the most important part um, was probably the brainstorming activities. We had um, in the first set of workshops, 30 people coming from very different areas um, of the Department of Public Health coming together, meeting people from different groups, and working together to brainstorm about what they could do to um, promote resiliency to climate change, what partnerships they could leverage, and what skills they had that they could leverage to promote resiliency within the, the region. Um, Another one of the things that we focused on was helping the participants to learn to communicate the risks of climate change more effectively, 
um, and specifically how to make sure that they're generating desired behaviors and minimizing unwanted behaviors instead of just discouraging people that they talk to. Um, we had really great results in terms of the participation participant feedback from this series um, in terms of their um, self-perceived increases in knowledge and their, um, their plans to use the information and skills from the workshops um, going forward in their daily activities. And I just wanted to mention that um, we're making these materials available um, more broadly to other organizations through um, the Los Angeles Regional Collaborative for Climate Action Sustainability and their website. Finally, I just wanted to emphasize that um, we've had tremendous co-benefits from these partnerships with the local health department. Um, on our end, um, it's been really an important ex uh, practical experience for the doctoral students who are working on this project. For them, the ability to um, engage in these really substantive discussions and presentations with public health professionals um, was transformative and um, has really um, helped them leverage um, those, those new networks um, for their own research as well. So finally, I just wanted to acknowledge um, our wonderful collaborators at the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, Angelo Belomo, who has had the vision to really push forward with um, the climate action plan for the county, and Elizabeth Rhodes, Charlene Contreras, and Melina Bakshi, who have all been critical in terms of that partnership and driving it forward. And uh, I mentioned um, Alex Hall and his this, um, wonderful communication expert, Catherine Reich um, from UCLA, um, a doctoral student from the University of Denver, Joseph Hoover, and then the doctoral students here at um, the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health, and our uh, wonderful um, high school student, Matthew Rosen, who interned with us this past summer. And I'd be happy to answer questions. It looks like we have a bunch Hi, of Dr. Them. Godwin, thank you very much for this. Yeah, um, we actually yeah. Uh, have about, mm, about 10 to 12 minutes for questions. And, and uh, I wanted to save, no, I noticed that um, John Eldon from UC San Diego had asked two questions. And, and I want to save the second one for the end, because I think it might be a great way to wrap up the whole talk. But um, he did mention that with more frequent Santa Ana winds, he uh, anticipated that uh, there might be a much greater average temperature increase in coastal areas than shown in the graphics. And I think he was looking for some feedback on that. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, so. Um, I, I would have to go back and ask, ask Alex Hall um, how Santa Ana's were incorporated into those projections for temperatures um, for the region. Um, although it's worth going back and, uh, you know, it, since some of the Santa Ana stuff happened secondary to um, the original temperature projections, I can't say definitively that they were included in there, but it's certainly something that's on their radar screen. Um, but when we look at the, the temperatures for the baseline for those areas, that certainly includes Santa Ana's currently. And so you can see that for, you know, it's a, those are really high temperatures to meet the criteria of extremely hot days um, and are fairly atypical for us in, in those areas, those coastal areas. Now, um, Linda also had asked about how the vulnerability assessment HVA um, approach compares uh, with that of the CDC's BRACE vulnerability assessment process, and I was, uh, is that something that you've, you've looked at? Yeah, so, um, yeah, and that obviously will be in this manuscript that, that we're working on. So um, I would, if I had to characterize sort of the main differences between the HVA approach versus um, some of the other published approaches, whether it's the CDC approach or also um, um, OEHA and California Department of Public Health have some wonderful tools. The main difference is um, this idea of um, pulling out individual health impacts um, and looking at um, not just the health in impacts themselves individually, but also the um, vulnerabilities to those specific health impacts and the preparedness for those specific health impacts together. So, um, so that the end score that you get for each of the impacts reflects the vulnerabilities and the preparation for that specific impact alone. So, which is different from some of the other methodologies which give 
overall scores in terms of vulnerabilities, but are not um, specifically geared towards um, the different health impacts. And the reason that we focused on that really arose from this collaboration with LA County Department of Public Health and um, the realization when we were working with them that the responses were going to be very different depending upon, and how we would build resiliency will be very different depending upon what the health impact is. So the way that we build resiliency to extreme health um, extreme heat events is very different, obviously, from the way that we build resiliency to sea level rise. And likewise, the types of populations, although there's some overlap in terms of the populations that are vulnerable to those, they can, there can be significant differences. So it's important to separate out at the level of um, impact to be thinking about both um, how we're going to respond, whether we've prepared for that, and also who's vulnerable. Um, if any of our listeners, by the way, want access to workshop materials, are those available and, and who, who can, can they contact about that? Yeah, so they should feel free to contact me directly. Uh, my email is hgodwin, G-O-D-W-I-N, at ucla.edu. And as I mentioned, we're also working to put them up on the uh, LARC website as well. Um, so up on the LARC website, there'll be um, recordings for the six core workshops and PDF versions of um, all of the materials. But if people are interested in, for instance, um, working on adaptations of those, um, they should just contact me directly. Um, and is it possible for uh, local health departments to modify the workshop materials to make them more appropriate for their own jurisdictions based on you know, uh, health impacts? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, here, I guess, um, our advice would be based upon um, what we've seen here in Los Angeles is that to the extent that it's possible to build a consortium with local climate experts um, that can help you with um, digging into some of those local impacts, that's, that's obviously ideal. But um, we're happy to share um, the materials and, and work with people if they want to adapt them for, for other situations as well. Um, Stephen asks, uh, in California, are there other public health impacts due to increased coastal sea levels other than flooding and displacement to vulnerable communities in low-lying areas? Yeah, one of the big impacts that, that's projected for um, as a result of sea level rise on health is impacts on water quality. So, uh, and this is both for us locally and also across the state. So. Uh, what you see is that as sea level rises, there's encroachment into groundwater. And as a result, you see um, the groundwater becoming more salinated. That makes it much more difficult to um, bring it to drinking water quality. Um, and it also can impact our overall water supply as well. So for instance, in the um, San Joaquin Delta, there's big concerns about water quality as a result of, of sea level rise. So that, I would say, is a huge, huge projected impact, other than the more obvious ones of, of flooding and impacts on infrastructure. And uh, just give everyone a last call for questions. Uh, if you have anything that you want to ask, please make sure you type it into the chat box. Um, I did want to address uh, John's question from earlier. It, the, the question is, what role can and should public health folks play in convincing the climate change deniers that we do have a problem and need to take um, often unpopular action, and how do we stop making the earth a political football? And I, I wanted to, to point out something you, that you said early on um, before we, uh, the room started filling up a little more, um, it, which is 97% of climate change researchers um, agree that it's an issue, and, and you had mentioned that, you know, it's really hard to get anybody in academia, 97% of anybody in academia to agree on anything. Is that, I mean, would you say that's fair? Yeah, the other thing that um, we've really focused on in, in this collaboration with um, LA County is emphasizing that the types of actions that, that you need to build resiliency to climate change um, are things that are good for our communities in general. So even if you don't believe that climate change is happening, these are all things that will improve the health of our communities and particularly our most vulnerable populations. So it's not like we're wasting effort doing these activities. These are great things to be doing anyway. And in addition, the same holds true for a lot of the mitigation activities. So for instance, 
um, a lot of the efforts that you can take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will also uh, result in decreased emissions of other types of pollutants that result in poor air quality and really have adverse um, health outcomes for our, our populations in California. So um, engaging those type of mitigation activities also can have huge positive co-benefits for health for our communities. And I think, I think John's question is definitely something that everyone always asks, right? I mean, just what, what can be done um, to make, I don't know, the reality of the situation more, more obvious to some folks? Yeah, so um, what people have seen overall is that people respond um, to health messaging uh, better than they do to a lot of other messaging, and this is where the public health community can really play an important role. Um, it's unfortunate, but we often feel, respond better to health messaging about us and our children than we do health messaging about someone halfway across the world. But in this case, there are plenty of projected impacts for us here in Los Angeles. Um, and so um, making sure that people understand there are really significant impacts that are projected for our communities here in Los Angeles, but we can do something about them. So it, it's worth engaging in this. It's worth taking action. Looks like the, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Cassie Rouser um, is asking, as you know, in the past week, President Obama announced a commitment to evaluate the health effects of climate change. Why do you think it took so long for this connection to be made a priority? Uh, I mean, this might be more of a subjective question, but if you feel like yeah, so the, the timing of President Obama's announcement was actually strategically um, chosen to synergize um, with Public Health Week. So um, th it was, that announcement was accompanied by um, a letter that was signed off by most of the deans um, of schools of public health across the country expressing a commitment to training people in, um, in ways that will help to build resiliency to climate change and help mitigate climate change. Um, so it was, part of it was sort of a strategic decision on, on their part. Um, I, you know, for us it seemed like a no-brainer announcement, but I think part of it is, again, a sort of making sure that there's, um, it, it's been politically a, an uphill battle, and what we need to do within the public health community is shift the, the discussion away from one that's political in nature to one that says, regardless of your politics, um, people care about their own and other people's health and well-being, and we all need to um, make sure that we're acting in ways that will ensure healthy futures for the United States and the world um, in the future. All right, um, I, I think we're going to be out of time, uh, so thank you. If anybody has any other questions, can they email you, or is there some contact information that, where they can contact you? Yeah, absolutely. I would say feel free to email me. I noticed Linda said she missed the answer about where the materials are available, but Linda, just email me at h-g-o-d-w-i-n at ucla.edu, and I will send you the link. All right, and Dr. Godwin, thank you so much for this interesting talk. Uh, I think it's really interesting that in your action uh, plan slide, you mentioned you need we need to increase the noise and decrease the noise in order to uh, make this issue uh, just much more prevalent and much more important. Um, so thank you again for joining us, Dr. Godwin, who is our uh, professor uh, in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences as well as our associate dean for academic programs. Please. Uh, join us next month uh, when we continue the conversation with Professor Wendy Slusser. She will be talking about, uh, or uh, talking on, on her topic, Raising a health, Healthy Child, Make the Healthy Choice the Easy Choice. And she is part of our UCLA Healthy Campus Initiative, so that should be a very, very interesting talk as well. Again, if you have missed any of our previous webinars, just go to the School of Public Health's website, ph.ucla.edu, and they are all archived there although um, please allow a few days for this one to post. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Hillary Godwin. Thank you.